you know, everything we deal with on this show for the last 11 years has really been about the American ruling class. When we talk about Russian history or Balkan history, we're talking about how American historians manipulate it and lie about it and what their motivation is. That's been the point of everything. Now, how the American ruling class... Now, the American ruling class is not the same thing as the government. The government is an element of the ruling class. And on, on rare occasions, um, the early part of the Trump administration and the Nixon administration, uh, maybe a small part of the Reagan administration, there's been a separation between the ruling class and the state. The Vietnam War is proof of that. The ruling class was against it. The state was in favor of it. The ruling class is far larger. The ruling class includes um, you know, the banks, of course, the most powerful, all the corporate elites, you know, communications, media, um, ethnic elites, uh, the universities, certainly all media conglomerates, uh, all the transnationals, and then, of course, the government. Um, and I think, really, the banks and the media are the two are the two dominant ones. They rule. They decide what's real and what isn't, what's just and what isn't, what exists and what doesn't exist. That's the issue here. Um, I'm going to talk about the United States and one event that I, I, you know, some time ago I started researching and I, I kind of forgot about it. I want to preface it by talking about James Fields. And I want to talk about Fields only because it's by way of contrast. I want to contrast Angela Davis to James Fields. James Fields' trial was a farce. Um, the evidence was overwhelming in his favor. To say that there's reasonable doubt is, is, is an understatement. There was no blunt force trauma. The woman died of a heart attack, according to her mother. Um, the Anti-Defamation League was saying that they were they were coaching law enforcement here. The only reason that the jury convicted is because they were under the impression that Antifa, with the full support of the city, would destroy the town. That, that jury would be hunted down by communists with full state support. Um, the fact that this guy, you know, I mean, I saw the original raw footage we went back to uh, when that first happened. He was going at a very low rate of speed, and I watched the communists try to smash up his car. They were trying to pull the windshield out. And, of course, a gun was pointed at him. And these people weren't supposed to be there. The, the police had ordered them out, and they cleared the streets. Not to mention they had removed a, a roadblock. Many of you know this this story. If he wanted to hurt anybody, he would have gunned that, that muscle car and he would have hit them at 70 miles an hour. But he hit them so slowly that the airbag didn't even deploy. Obviously, he wasn't trying to hurt anybody. Evidence had nothing to do with it. This was all on video. The left, in these kind of rallies, as they've said over and over again in public, were there to commit violence. They were there to kill people. They were there to... To smash it, they had weapons. They had every, you know. This is again, none of this is um, is news to you. But most of this is also understood by the left. There's no desire for actual justice here. They want to normalize the killing of these people. Um, the fact that he actually defended himself from a, a riotous mob who, for the last forty years has violently attacked policemen and right-wing speakers and groups um, at great cost to the society, is what the problem is. Now, I mention this because, I mean, obviously the reasonable doubt is, is everywhere. Leftist terrorists are not only, not, not, that, not that it feels as a terrorist by any means, but the left actually does commit these acts of violence. They do try to kill people. They often do kill people. Like the Mamin al Jamal issue. The guy has, has admitted his guilt. Um, when he first was, was brought to the hospital, he, he said so. There are four witnesses 
showing him get the entire ruling class, all of Hollywood, all these academics by the ton, with very, very poor argumentation, want him released. And apparently, the um, DA is, is on their side. The reason I know that they want to normalize the killing of these people is they're not just arguing for his release, but they're physically attacking the policeman's widow. So this isn't about, you know, they, they know he did it. That's exactly why he should be released. You can't assume that, that these people have the same conception of justice that you do. And many of you know the, the Fields case, the, the laughable amounts of reasonable doubt, how nothing made any sense about the, about the prosecution. Now let's compare that to something that occurred the year I was born, 1971, and it's been almost completely forgotten, like all of this stuff, completely forgotten, the Marin County Courthouse murders, 1970-1971. Marin County uh, Civic Center in St. Rafael, California, was attacked by leftist terrorists twice. August 7th, 1970, Jonathan Jackson tried to essentially spring the, the so-called Soledad brothers from pit prison that were convicted of murder by kidnapping Superior Court Judge Harold Haley from the courthouse there in St. Raphael. And it ended with a bloodbath and four were killed, including the judge himself. The prosecutor was shot, was paralyzed for life. The Soledad brothers were three black murderers who killed a white prison guard, John Vincent Mills, in the Soledad prison in, in, in January of 1970. The murderers say that this was a retaliation killing. And it was retaliation for um, three black prisoners who were shot dead by a corrections officer, Opie Miller, and they claim the fight, a fight began where two white inmates were beaten to the ground and were going to be killed. Um, and after a warning shot to save the lives of these guys, they fired and, and killed the, the, the attackers. The officer who did it uh, shouted, he blew a whistle. Um, and because there was immediate danger to life and limb, according to protocol, they shot to kill. If they waited any longer, the white inmates would have been killed. What's interesting is that that normally segregated prison um, was subject to an integration experiment for the first time in a long time. And of course, the results were predictable. Now, Fifteen men in the yard were the first integrated exercise period at all. So this was a tit-for-tat situation. Um, they tried to claim that guards barred them from taking the wounded to the infirmary. They were laying there, you know, bleeding for 20 minutes, as, as the as the media said. But since there's no obvious reason for this, the reason is, is because the guards who were outnumbered couldn't have the spillover to the general population. Um, they needed a total lockdown of the prison before they could bring the, the people in. That's, that's how it goes. This is the fault of the attackers. The next day, 13 black inmates began a hunger strike, demanding a federal investigation. And that the officer in shooting the would-be murderers was wrong. And the black nationalists there were demanding segregated facilities. And of course, no charges were filed by the grand jury because Miller, who fired the shots, was fully justified and operating within the scope of his duties because they were going to kill this guy. So in 1970, the ruling class threw the weather underground which was a, a terrorist organization that now is is venerated almost as deities. They're, they're murderers and, and, and terrorists who were given university appointments, and many of them were quite wealthy, ordered an attack on the Marin County Courthouse to effect his release. One of the people who were you know people who were implicated in that killing, and they were going to get his release by kidnapping the judge and whoever else they could. Now the media account is completely absurd. James McLean, who was one of the guys who had been accused of stabbing the prison guard, 
Again, the stabbing of the prison guard was as a result of the killing I just described. And Judge Haley was on the bench. The person in charge of the kidnapping was George Jackson's younger brother, Jonathan. Close, very close, to the infamous Angela Davis. Two days before the kidnapping the attack on the courthouse, Angela Davis bought a shotgun, among other things, sawed off the barrels, and these were the weapons that were used in the in the attack. Angela Davis was a professor at UCLA, and I put professor in quotes, um, was hunted down because all of the weapons that were used were purchased by her, and then she was close to the killers. Uh, immediately afterwards, um, the weathermen uh, set several bombs um, in the area, received almost no media attention. But Angela Davis is a privileged, powerful member of the system. She is part of the ruling class. She got her degrees from the, the Jewish Brandeis University in California, San Diego, and allegedly received a doctorate in East Germany at Humboldt University in Berlin. I can't find her dissertation anywhere. And did she speak German? No, she didn't. Was the philosophy department totally fluent in English, such that they could they could read a dissertation? Of course not. It wouldn't matter anyway, because a Soviet bloc doctorate wouldn't be acceptable in the U.S., but the rules don't apply. She, of course, never spent a penny on her education. She was a full-blooded communist and Maoist, and this is precisely why she was financed and pushed through the system. She has not written an academic paper in her life. She is a total fraud. I don't think she, you know, she doesn't have a legitimate doctoral degree. I've read some of her material. She has no academic background. She's a total fraud. Despite all that, there was a bidding war on Davis. Princeton, Swarthmore, UCLA, all just bidding on her, throwing huge amounts of money. Why? She hadn't done anything by that point. She wasn't an academic. Her dissertation is nowhere to be found. She's a fraud. So this is how the regime installs these kind of people in university. This is how the system works. In the 1980s, she became a professor of ethnic studies at San Francisco State University, despite having zero qualifications in that area. And then a professor of the history of consciousness and the feminist studies department at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and then also in Rutgers from 91 to 2008. She has no background in any of this. And of course, she does no work there. She's paid a huge six-figure salary. She does very little. And she just makes polemical speeches. She was paid by the state to act as a communist activist. In 1971, the CIA estimated that about 5% of all Soviet intelligence actions in the West were in support of Angela Davis. And the East German intelligence was also a big part of this. But this prestige and power is incredible for anybody. She hadn't written anything of substance. She was just a useful tool to be used within the academic system. She was a friend of Herbert Marcuse and part of the uh, Frankfurt School as well. So, to summarize, you have a tit-for-tat killing at the Soledad prison, the shooting of the blacks who were attacking the white inmates, led to a stabbing of a guard, and that stabbing is what this court case is about. So in August of 1970, a heavily armed Jonathan Jackson, the brother of one of the um, killers, showed up at the courthouse in a rented van. It's August now, in San Rafael, California, but he's wearing a buttoned-up long red coat, a raincoat. Now, this was a time of widespread leftist terrorism. It was extreme unrest. Why did this guy showing up in such an outfit in a van not raise any suspicion? He was checked by no security, and strangely enough, there were no metal detectors. There was nothing of the kind. You could just wander in and out of the courtroom in a high-profile trial that had already been threatened by the weather underground. So this doesn't make any sense so far. Someone on the inside has had to have let this happen. No courthouse in urban America would permit this. This was an extremely violent era. But of course, no one uh, mentions this but me. Jackson sat in the gallery for a long time, 
and then took a pistol out of the inside of his coat. Still, no suspicion at this guy. No one noticed you know, how odd it is to be dressed like this. He threw a pistol in the air to the defendant, who then caught it, and then put the pistol to the judge's head. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. That's something straight out of the movies. There's no armed deputies in the entire courtroom. This is a trial of a terrorist in a highly politicized court case. That would have been in a secure room with heavily armed deputies everywhere. There's none. Threats were already made against this courtroom for weeks. Then Jackson pulls out an M1 from his raincoat as McLean holds the pistol to Judge Haley's head. And still, no deputies would be found anywhere. Hostages were taken, bound with piano wire. I don't know how they knew it was piano wire. They tie these guys up. Still no armed deputies anywhere. There wasn't a single deputy in the entire courtroom. The hostages were the uh, deputy district attorney, Gary Thomas, and jurors um, Maria Graham, Doris Whitmer, and, and Joyce uh, Rodoni. So the four kidnappers moved into the hallway. And finally, you see the first armed sheriff's deputy. Now, he, you know, he pulls this gun and throws this perfect Terry Bradshaw throw, grabs the, you know, catches it perfectly and puts it right up against the temple of the, of the judge. But somehow in that period of time, the judge was able to call the sheriff's department. I don't know why they weren't there in the first place. And that's why they were in the hallway. And just conveniently, there was a photographer with the hostage organization. He wasn't seen of the threat. He took some great pictures. He worked for the St. Raphael Independent Journal. And he became the official photographer of the incident. This had to have been planned. And insiders had to have known about this. None of this makes any sense. The story is ridiculous. So the police set up a roadblock outside of the Civic Center. I don't know how they had the time to do this. Jonathan Jackson drove the hostage three convicts away from the courthouse... For some reason, the passenger, the guy who was uh, on trial, shot for some reason at the police station in the parking lot. Judge Haley was then shot and killed by the communists. Well, the official story says the police shot back, but this is not procedure. Another are roadblocks, by the way. Why did no one shoot out the tires? Now, Gary Thomas, who was the DA, worked his way free of the piano wire, grabbed the gun from Jackson, and began shooting his kidnappers. He killed three of them. He almost ended the whole thing, but he ran out of ammunition. This DA saved the day. Only one Black Panther remained, and that was uh, Ruchel McGee. They did get a shot off, and, and, and they paralyzed him for life. Uh, Prosecutor Thomas was paralyzed with a bullet through the spine. No one's quite sure where the, where the bullet came from. In other words, the DA saved many lives that day. But he's not even remembered. No one called Thomas a hero, even though he's in a wheelchair for life. He killed the terrorists, and no one talks about him. But before he was able to do that, they executed the judge. No one's talking about this. I mean, it was forgotten very quickly after it was done. So Angela Davis, given that these were her guns, a warrant was issued. Now she became a fugitive. She was a so-called professor at UCLA, so she's a, she's a public figure. But there was a full underground railroad already in existence. This had been planned out in advance. She was taken away by this. It was a huge communist underground, tons of money. The underground brought her to Chicago, and um, she met up with David Poindexter, a leader of the communists there, and he brought her to Miami, Florida. Poindexter was a black man, a communist of great wealth, as most of them are. He drove his wife to suicide. He um, he apparently was into whores, and that's why his wife killed himself. He drove expensive cars and all this stuff. But this this is a man who's going to overthrow the government and tell everyone how to live. So the escape of Angela Davis was planned in advance, which proves her guilt. She used all kinds of disguises. It was all kinds of money. The East Germans were involved. KGB was involved. And the American ruling class was involved. So finally, October 
1970, the FBI found her in a Howard Johnson's in New York City. Uh, Rutsu McGee had pleaded guilty to the charge of aggravated kidnapping, but the murder charge was dropped. The murder charge was allegedly dropped because he pled to kidnapping. Does this make any sense? They're going to drop first-degree murder because he pleads to kidnapping? What, is the judge not dead anymore because he does this? Was James Fields given a chance like this? But then he tried to withdraw his plea. In 1975, he was sentenced to life in prison. The jury had already been told to be on his side, and he didn't know that. That's why they had five mistrials, even though no one denied he was guilty. How can you have five mistrials when there was no question as to his guilt? You had a direct eyewitness. He was the only one there. Everyone saw him, and this was, this was a public event. The only explanation for that was the court was rigged. But McGee didn't get the memo until too late. He had already pled when he finally got the communication that the, that the, 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 the jury was fixed. It was already too late, and they wouldn't let him withdraw the plea. October 8, 1970, the courthouse now hosts Angela Davis, now on trial. Still no security. Still no metal detectors, nothing. More bombs went off. No one said a word. The weatherman claimed responsibility for this. And that was in protest of the DAs killing the, the uh, terrorists in the escape attempt in the hostage situation. The DA, by the way, who was paralyzed, he died in 2017. Remember, Angela Davis is still alive. It's a multimillionaire. Goes from university to university. She is considered a, a genius. All of this stuff that I've just described is completely ignored, forgotten. But even the Weather Underground terrorists, they set off thousands of bombs between 1969 and 1971. Jeff Jones is one of their bombers. He's a respected environmentalist activist in New York. Bill Ayers is the worst one, a university professor at the University of Illinois, and a respected theorist of education, despite the fact that this man was talking about killing white people, instituting a Soviet system, uh, setting off bombs everywhere. No problem. Still has tenure. And, you know, Ayers didn't write about educational theory. These are all frauds. They're not really academics. They're just endless leftist cliches strung together. This isn't exactly, you know, these aren't dissidents. These aren't rebels. The rebels aren't given tenured positions at a university for nothing. And six-figure jobs and no work. And insulated from all moral responsibility. No, the weathermen were agents of the regime. That's the only thing that could explain this that could explain the mistrials, the um, the complete media blackout right after this was done. The weathermen bombed the U.S. Capitol in 1971 against the escalation of the war in Laos. And somehow they bombed the Pentagon and the State Department. Those were relatively small bombs, but that's not the point. How did they do it? There's no way to bomb the Pentagon without inside help. And no one talks about this today. Now, they claim they didn't kill anybody, but I, I don't believe the press in any of this stuff. The reason they were done was to show the world that the system is behind this. Because you can't put a bomb in the Pentagon without it. And then have everyone forget about it later. This is just unbelievable. Now, in 71, on trial for the Mills murder, George Jackson was fatally shot in San Quentin during an escape attempt. The officers claimed that he had smuggled a 9mm pistol into the prison and he and nearly two dozen other prisoners were attempting to escape. Three guards and two inmates were killed in the battle. Six of those inmates were tried for murder. Of course, the left was screaming for their release. The same Quentin Six they were called. Of course, the inmates had to have had firearms if the COs were shot. And no one has any idea how a pistol was smuggled into a maximum security prison. Now those um, who were shot by the officers for good reason, their families have received settlements. $1.2 million 
against Opie Miller for the deaths of their sons, despite the grand jury clearly clearing him. Jet Magazine reported in 1975 the family received $270,000 from the state of California after an all-white jury decided that eight prison employees had caused the inmates' deaths. Does this make any sense? There was no criminal liability, and therefore no civil damages. The grand jury and everyone said the state had done absolutely nothing wrong. So what's the legal ground for this payout? All this money going to the families of those who were legitimately killed. There's only one explanation, and that's it's a payment of a salary. That's what the civil judgments are. You can't have a civil judgment without any wrongdoing, without any fault, without any negligence, without any criminality. That's been established. So where are these huge payouts to the families of these guys who were killed, these murderers and thugs who were killed? Now think about the trial of James Fields. Now I'm going to talk about the trial of Angela Davis. It is a farce. It can't be explained by anything other than the fact that the system we live in is leftist and designed to protect leftist terrorists. They're not terrorists. They're regime agents. And they get paid. The trial of James Field was no different than a Cheka trial in the early 1920s. Angela Davis' trial was the exact opposite. I mean, to this day, leftist murderers from leftist regimes from all over the world haven't been brought to trial. Two or three guys from the Khmer Rouge, and that is it. For all the communist murderers, no one has been brought to justice, just except a couple of guys connected to Pol Pot. And Pol Pot, by the way, was defended um, substantially by Angela Davis and the Black Panthers. The Weather Underground, who bombed, got you know, they burnt down our OTC buildings. Terrorism beyond belief, and they're considered heroes today. How can that be? Well, they were a loose body of terrorists that could do what the ruling class really couldn't do directly on their own. And they could do it with great efficiency. The ruling class promoted their agenda with these people. That's why they were never prosecuted, and that's why not only were they not prosecuted, but they were given millions of dollars. They worked for the ruling class, you talk about either the Fields trial or the Davis trial. There is no explaining this, these, these ridiculous events using normal legal terms. Angela Davis had 20 witnesses testify against her. Many saw her and heard her planning the attacks. It was a simple open and shut case. In the Fields case, we had videotapes showing his innocence, showing reasonable doubt everywhere. Doesn't matter, he was convicted anyway. You had video evidence here. Now, Gary Thomas, the guy who was paralyzed, and the, uh, the hero who was, who was paralyzed, was a star witness against Davis. Davis had an army of lawyers somehow. Millions of dollars worth, worth of lawyers. She, she had more lawyers than OJ. They even tried to argue that his handicap is part of the reason why he may not remember what the guns looked like. They really went after him. This guy who was a hero uh, in a wheelchair, the jury had no problem with this. They had no sympathy for him. Again, this was a red jury, as I'll mention here in a minute. He identified the shotgun that Angela Davis bought. Remember, they killed the judge. A huge kidnapping thing. Not you know, really major news for more than a few days. Obviously, the guy's going to remember this gun that was pointed to his head. And he described it exactly and perfectly. Still, the jury was fixed. Angela Davis was acquitted. She was acquitted with overwhelming evidence against him. And when that was done, one of the jurors, Ralph Delange, who was an electrician, raised his fists in the communist salute. Ten of the twelve jurors went out with Angela Davis that night and party to celebrate the victory. Activists were placed on the jury with the knowledge of the prosecution. Then the defense was trying to find out personal information about the jurors. They're going to their homes, their jobs, figuring out how to manipulate them. Still, no mistrial. She was released without any bail. She was a flight risk. She had already disappeared. She already fled. She took months to track her down. 
but she's released without bail. That's the whole point of bail. The Los Angeles Times reported that the, the jurors refused to take notes during the prosecution's presentations, but they certainly did for the defense. The defense relied entirely on technicalities, trying to discredit the guy in the wheelchair who said everything he was supposed to. He couldn't tell the difference between two identical Magnum 357s on the table in front of him. And that they use as an argument that none of his testimony is valid. It was a rigged trial. Mary Timothy, who was the forewoman of the jury, was an openly Marxist feminist. This is why the women, this is an all-white jury. Many women, they voted to acquit. Not because she was innocent. They didn't think that. No, they didn't acquit her because of evidence, but because they were protesting oppression. The dead bodies, the grieving families, didn't matter. Because that is perfectly okay by these people. You talk about the Attica riots, Mami al-Jamal, any of these people. Dead bodies of their enemies is something to be lauded. It doesn't matter. That's not the crime here. In the Mami al-Jamal situation, it isn't that he didn't kill the guy. It's that he did kill the guy. That's not a crime in the eyes of the left. That's why the ruling class, I mean, multi, you know, this, Al-Jamal has given two, of course, Al-Jamal, this is a, a, a separate instance that occurred in 1981, but a very similar situation. Yes, he was convicted, it was so overwhelming, but in response, you had riots organized in major cities, you had eyewitnesses all over the place showing this man doing it, killing this guy at point blank range, for really no good reason, and all these people were Marxists. They were all Black Panthers, Davis and, and Jamal later on, who advocated the killing of white people. This is what they did. This is what the Maoist revolution is all about. Angela Davis was acquitted. There was no explanation for this other than a rigged jury. The whole story that the press told about how this kidnapping went down that Davis was responsible for doesn't make any sense. Now, circumstantial evidence is what, you know, of course we had, we had eyewitness evidence here. But in the Davis trial, Pierce piecing everything together um, was called circumstantial by the defense, despite the fact there's nothing wrong with circumstantial evidence. You can convict on circumstantial evidence. Not everything is, is direct eyewitnesses. Now, one circumstance isn't enough, but if you have 20 things, the chances of a coincidence are extremely minimal and therefore within reasonable doubt. Not every trial has fingerprints or, or Polaroids. You had clear witnesses everywhere. For a guy like James Fields, you had videotaped evidence. There was no evidence that this man had any intent. There's no question about it, but they convicted him anyway. For Angela Davis, a generation earlier, the evidence was overwhelming, and they acquitted her. Juries are rigged. Juries are fixed. I remember when the Fields trial first began, we all were saying there's no way he could be convicted. Intent, he didn't have any intent. It's so easy to show that. Everything is on video. There's no blunt force trauma here. He didn't hit her. That's easy enough to show. There's so many, there's so many uh, photos and videos. All of this was shown. It didn't make any difference. As I said before, if he wanted to kill someone, he would have floored the thing and hit them at 100 miles an hour. And this is the frustrating part of it. The truth doesn't make any difference. That's not the point here. Revolution is the point here. And revolutions require dead bodies. And that's what they defend. Killing white cops by black communists is something that the ruling class accepts. That's why they support to this day the Black Panthers, the Weather uh, Underground, and Mamiya Al-Jamal, and Angela Davis. Angela Davis is 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 a multimillionaire, as I said before. I've read some of her books. They're they're not philosophical books at all. They're just polemical speeches. Someone with a high school education can give. She doesn't have a real PhD. That's all nonsense. That's why they have her getting it at Humboldt University in East Germany, even though she didn't speak German. But of course, somehow they got all these English speakers over there who could read an, an academic dissertation with no problem. Davis didn't uh, testify on her own behalf. 
because the fix was already in, there was no reason for it, and partially because uh, she would have incriminated herself. She would have began preaching about killing pigs because she had been saying this her whole career. This is what this is what this philosopher used to say in, in the university. She advocated terrorism all over the place. The only reason they let her go, they fired her, was because the FBI was after her, and even that under great protest. The minute she was acquitted, she was immediately rehired. Angela Davis was close to these killers. She worked closely with them. She bought these weapons just days before the event, and witness saw, witnesses saw all this. She spoke of killing these classes of people, you know, pigs and cops from her so-called lecture hall at UCLA, with government money. She was immediately hired back, with proving that even that was a scam. The fact that she was able to flee police for months in this communist underground with big money, foreign support, means the whole thing had been planned out in advance and therefore she was guilty. During the deliberations in the jury room, there was no examination of evidence. The New York Times said that they played cards and talked. One juror looked over documents. There was no real discussion. This is how you know the jury was fixed. The court was stacked, and the defense knew it. That's why Davis didn't take the stand. That's why Mami al-Jamal didn't take the stand. He doesn't, you know, he he holds to his innocence only because of his um, his press. But he's admitted it more than once. And the crippling of, of the DA Thomas, not a problem, that's collateral damage. Clearly, these people are guilty. There's, there's no doubt about it. Just as James is innocent. None of her published works are academic in nature. I read, um, and they have all these pompous titles. I read uh, The Meaning of Freedom and Other Difficult Dialogues. Sounds like an academic work, right? It's not. These are just stump speeches. There is no academic production from this woman. She is not an academic. I've heard her speak. I've read her things. She doesn't talk like she has any knowledge of academic life whatsoever. I've read her Lectures on Liberation, 1971. If you read her attempts to make sense out of Hegel, um, it's humorous. Clearly she's coming from a, she read something in a secondary source. She doesn't quote him, there's no, there's no, um, there's no citations or anything. A few lines, and that's pretty much it. That's her philosophical content in the book. She has no knowledge of this stuff and wasn't expected to. These professors at these universities are hired and they do no work. She was given a huge salary. Today, um, hundreds of, of, of dorm rooms, uh, university, university houses, um, roads and streets are named for her. All her education was paid by the regime. The Black Panthers today are celebrated. Just like the Weathermen, these were terrorists, these were killers. Full professors and universities, despite no education whatsoever. Now, the reason I mentioned Davis at all is that she's been in the news recently because some of her so-called civil rights awards, she has every award you can imagine, have been withdrawn. Not because she advocated the killing of whites, Mao's slaughter of, 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 uh, anti-communists, killing of police officers. No. No. It's because she supports the BDS. The boycott and divest sanctions movement, uh, against Israel. That's why all of a sudden there's an interest in Angela Davis again, very recently. I read the National Review, the New York Post, condemning Anyone giving an award to Angela Davis, the Smithsonian has given her this great award. I mean, she is a deity. They call her an icon. And the only reason that they're opposed to this is that she's anti-Zionist. So there's no opposition to Angela Davis's legacy. The only thing they could say, not that she was obviously guilty, not that she was involved in the killing of a judge, uh, paralyzing of a man, the terrorizing of a, of a of an entire courtroom that somehow had no security in it. None of that. She said the Zionists are just like the fascists. 
That's the only reason why the National Review and these other uh, other places want to see her her array of civil rights awards taken away from her. It didn't take long for me to see how blatantly guilty this woman was, what a fraud this woman was. Nothing about this story makes sense. Not one aspect of Davis's biography, of the events of that day, of all the killings, how the the um, the families of the black inmates shot by the guard who was trying to save the life of two white inmates who were going to be killed, how they are receiving millions of dollars from the state. There is no explanation for this, as I've already said. It's a payment of a salary. It's a payoff. They're being paid. This is how they're being paid. There is absolutely no legal grounds for giving these people money. All the newspapers say, and I've read every, you know, all the, you know, from back then and, and recently, and I'll see back in the news again, is that because their sons were shot by this guy, which of course is true. They say nothing more than that. So the newspapers have no idea why she's being given this, or they're being given this money. And it's this tit-for-tat violence in the prison system which led to the kidnapping of the judge and the murder of the judge and that Angela Davis was the was the mastermind. I mentioned uh, Mia al-Jamal um, because he also was a Black Panther. He was convicted, although recently the death penalty has been removed, even though he was clearly guilty that he was seen by a bunch of witnesses shooting his policeman at, at point-blank range. That's not the issue. That's not the question. They claimed that cops were racist. Now, this is 1981. The city of Philadelphia was drowning in violent crime. The cops were, were being beaten all over the place. Gang violence, this is all just beginning there. Crime was absolutely out of control. This is long before these, these police departments were, were armored and, and, and given the proper weaponry. Drugs were exploding. Everything that the regime laid out in the late 60s was now coming, coming home to roost. Overwhelmingly, of course, non-white. The perpetrators of this crime were almost all non-white in Philadelphia. So, of course, enforcement is going to be against non-whites. Now, of course, the people in the, the, the black organizations and communists, they're aware of this. They know that violent crime is from these communities. They know that. They know that the cops have no choice but to patrol those areas, that white areas aren't particularly crime-ridden. And this is, again, in the early 80s. That's not the issue. It's not a crime if the leftists are killing people in the name of revolution. That's why Jamal uh, opened fire on the policemen. His own writings say this. But just like Angela Davis, Jamal is, is promoted as this intellectual. And, of course, you read any of his things, and he's, a, he's just a thug. I have the feeling some of his stuff was written by others and put in his name. There is a huge corporate movement for this guy. There's a, 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 got album covers and T-shirts and, and everything you can imagine. Uh, and, the, and the policeman, Daniel Faulkner, was killed for no reason. Jamal's brother was was um, arrested for resisting arrest in, in a traffic stop. Uh, Mamiya comes over, doesn't like it, and shoots the guy. He refused to say a word in his own defense. And even more, his own brother, William Cook, never testified on his brother's behalf. Um, refused. In fact, there was no one who was willing to take this guy's defense, who was close to him. Mamiya has become a rock star, just like Angela Davis. Corporate America has made a, a killing in marketing. Noam Chomsky, a Derrida, Tutu, uh, Tutu Mandela, Ilya Wiesel, all demanded his release, with full state support. Oliver Stone, Sting, Ed Asner, Alec Baldwin, Susan Sarandon, Martin Sheen, all have demanded his immediate release. And of course, they can't do that without those who own their contracts demanding that they do it. 
I can't believe that this guy served as a commencement speaker for two universities via a Skype hookup. Two universities had this guy as a commencement speaker from prison, from death row. Now, what this all means is that we live in a society that could only be called neo-communist. It's not Soviet, but this is a totalitarian, public-private, hybrid system. Rather than using class, like the Soviets did, they use race and gender. Class is out of the question. The left has made its peace with oligarchy. Psychological manipulation is used in the place of prison camps, although camps and, and violence are still being used by, by the system. The only real dissidents now are nationalists, loosely termed. We alone have the full set of facts and the secular questions of the day, and we go where no other political group is willing to go. We alone deal with race, ethnicity, and religion as essential categories of analysis. No one else will. And we are not afraid, as we've all shown a thousand times over, to have our livelihoods destroyed by those pretending to be powerless. Nationalists alone are actually powerless. And because of that, they're a threat. The ruling class uses people like Davis and the Weathermen to do its nasty street-level work. If you remember, when Obama was first elected, the Black Panthers, also in Philadelphia, were taking over voting booths. Massive. This is a felony. Um, voter intimidation. They were using violence right, right in the booth. The press was very slow to take note of this. This doesn't happen very often. But the Black Panthers were there, heavily armed, right, right in the voting booths. When a prosecution was was done, these guys would go away for a long time. When Obama was elected, he immediately squashed the investigation. Now today, of course, it's not the weatherman; it's it's Antifa. They're outsourcing. Um, the police powers of the ruling class. Um, nationalists are met, of course, with extreme violence and these ridiculous prison sentences. It doesn't make any difference what the facts are. That's not the issue. It's like going to a check detachment in 1920 and saying, oh, you guys aren't, aren't being fair. No, they're not supposed to be fair. That's what they are. They're a partisan force. Neo-communist regime is, is it's a very loose way of talking about the authoritarianism that comes from this very late globalized capitalism. Right around that very same time, some of you of a certain age may know this, of course, the Attica riots um, had raged in New York. Uh, Attica was designed, the maximum security prison designed for 1,500 men. There are about 2,300 because of this massive explosion in crime. And somehow both a black nationalist and a Maoist communist movement had formed in the prison, which is odd because no political literature is permitted there. Um, the Attica Liberation Front was formed somehow, and in a riot, they took about 40 guards hostage and threatened to kill them. The governor of New York was Nelson Rockefeller, and he ordered the raid on the prison that killed 36 people and wounded about 100. The ruling class, of course, condemned him all over the place, despite him being a Rockefeller. The Rockefeller Foundation was publishing the work that these prisoners were using to create their ALF. Somehow this group in the prison got a lawyer. That was the famous uh, William Kunstler. The entire thing was politicized from the start. In all of these cases, the press simply lied and invented a story usually doesn't make any sense. The Attica Manifesto was a list of 27 demands that these illiterate thugs could not possibly have written. And as we've been saying before, they all claim that they're not crimes. It's not that they didn't do these things. It's that it's just not criminal. And they make that very clear. Blacks can't do any wrong because that's the revolutionary underground. That's like saying the Cheka is somehow subject to, to a higher law. They viewed themselves as, as revolutionaries. And therefore, whoever they kill is perfectly legitimate. That's how revolutions are, are done. The LF demanded, and here were their demands that they sent when they took over the prison, right around this very same time. 
superior lawyers, medical facilities, an end to the segregation of prisoners based on political belief. So the prison already knew that there were communist cells being formed. And one issue that was covered up later, believe it or not, they demanded the privatization of the prison so they could work a normal eight-hour day. I don't really like talking about that one anymore. They demanded full liberty of political literature. They should form political unions. These are, these are, you know, these are only the worst criminals are, are at Attica. All discipline should be stopped. Mandated minimum wage. And full inmate control over prison policy. And special race agents be placed in the prison to help non-white prisoners. This was written, if you read the thing, the phrase is like, we as human beings demand the dignity and justice due to us by right of birth. We don't know how the present system of brutality and dehumanization and justice has been allowed to be, etc., etc. This isn't written by criminals. This is written by the regime on the outside. They didn't write it. Even though the state uh, prison commissioner was willing to accept some of these demands. The New York Times backed the prisoners 100%, despite all the debt. It doesn't make any difference. These men were convicted murderers and rapists because only the worst criminals went there. The media wouldn't even talk about this. William F. Buckley was the only guy to side with the governor. This whole thing started off with a rumor. You know, these guards weren't reading George Lincoln Rockwell. They weren't reading Gerald L. K. Smith. There's hostility between guards and prisoners because they're guards and prisoners. So from September 9th to the 15th, 1971, the prison was taken over by the prisoners. But William Kunstler, who somehow, I don't even know how these guys even got a lawyer, or who paid for it, he was observed telling the prisoners to be as obstinate as possible. He wanted to create a violent ending. That's right in his FBI file. He said that, well, you guys have hostages, so you could say whatever you want. And he encouraged them to be as violent as humanly possible. They, Kunstler brought in uh, the Maoists like Bobby Seale and Huey, Newt, uh, Huey Newton to reinforce the rebellion. He was bringing in reinforcements. How was this possible? These are the most violent terrorists in American history. And the press, of course, wasn't really concerned with the facts of the matter. They were going right to Kunstler. Um, he would, William F. Buckley was the only guy who wouldn't romanticize the prisoners. That Marxist prisoners were sent to Attica, meaning there was already a revolutionary cell there. All the demands, the press wouldn't say this, all the demands were accompanied by threats to kill the hostages. And Kunstler admitted to, to provoking the prisoners to violence. The minute that the prison was taken, of course, there were a lot of people killed. They blamed the troopers, despite the fact that several prison guards were killed in, in the process. Um, guards here were dealing with the most violent criminals, it was a criminal record that had guards and, and, and prisoners at each other's throats, but yet you read the newspapers and they say, well, this is terrible hostility between guards and prisoners. Well, they're supposed to be. But the end of it, Richard Nixon and, and Governor Rockefeller were totally isolated. They had no support from the state of New York, the prison system, guards, or the media. Whether underground, yet again, set off bombs all over the place in New York. Didn't even make the news. Mass killers or at Attica were considered leftist revolutionaries. In 1976, Governor Hugh Carey mysteriously pardoned them all, even though they didn't even ask for clemency. They even had appeals pending. How do you explain this if they're not, in fact, working for the regime? These cases weren't even finished yet, which I don't even think is fully legal to issue an appeal. There's an actual process you have to go through. There is a set of steps, whether at the federal level or the state level, to pardon people. He simply did it unilaterally, even though the cases were still going on. You have these strange anomalies here that can't be explained in normal procedural terms. They have to be explained elsewhere. No one else but me is doing this. The jury fix is blatantly obvious, whether it be in the Fields trial, Davis, um, the pardon, and these other things. The fix is in. In fact, you have dead bodies everywhere because of these communists and terrorists who now are, these leaders are now university professors and, and, and are given mountains of money. 
They're not even academics. This is a reward. This is a salary for the revolutionary work 40 years ago. We live in what could only be called a neo-communist, psychologically terrorized society ruled by an oligarchy. Um, it is an authoritarian system that protects and promotes leftist terrorism against white people or nationalists of, of all stripes. And that's the nature of the system right now. Justice does not exist. As far as the system is concerned, it's completely lawless. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Donate to Father Matt Johnson at RussJournal.org. RUSJournal.org.